Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, you and I are off to a place called Burnley. Burnley is a northern English town, home to quite a few people, but we're just talking about one, Katie. In 2022, Katie left her house one morning, went to another house, got in a van, and then disappeared. Soon revealed was a manipulative man, not just of Katie, but of the police, if you can believe it. Did it work? Have a guess. Though, you know, it's hard to spin a tale when you have an axe in your hand. Please subscribe to see new videos every week. Now, let's give it a go. Burnley is the setting for our story today. A northern English town, you know, Burnley and all that. It's an old ass town. It's from those olden days, if you can believe that. It peaked pretty good back in the day, but peaking back in the day isn't usually good for today. But by all accounts, it seems to be undergoing some of that good old regeneration. It's a center of manufacturing, which is probably why they have this structure outside of town that overlooks the area. Because it kind of looks like it was made from a load of leftover manufacturing shite. Holy moly though, it sings. Not very well. About 95,000 people live there. It's north of Manchester, west of Leeds. And speaking of Leeds, that's exactly what the police were looking for, hunting, hunting for, in late April 2022. It was the end of April, and in a forest approximately 50 minutes north of Burnley, Gisburn Forest, an extensive woodland that's... Okay, I can't do the accent anymore. That stretches ever northward. Police were converging there. This is in an area called the Forest of Boland. An area of rolling hills, woods, lakes, meadows, and the police were certain a woman named Katie Kenyon was being held there. Hopefully, she was still alive. Though they had, they had a little proof of that. 60 specially trained search officers now combed the forests. They had dogs, planes, drones, everything they could get their hands on. Katie Kenyon was 33 years of age, from Burnley, and a mother of two, to Coben and Honey. Her occupation? She worked in a care home. Katie had two sisters, and was very family-oriented, especially towards children. She loved children, and she would do everything with them. She had split from her children's father, and was raising the kids now by herself. She had her own struggles. She worked, yet money was tight. She also battled severe anxiety, but she was always able to put on a happy face, you know, for those around her. It was April 22nd that Katie Kenyon was last seen. Katie Kenyon had last been seen that day at approximately 9.30 a.m. on Todd Morden Road in South East Burnley. She had last been seen right outside the house of her boyfriends, captured on CCTV, and, and her boyfriend kind of sorted. It was like one of those on again, off again type situations, type sitches. Hey. His name was Andrew Burfield, 51 years of age, so a fair bit older than 33-year-old Katie, and he worked as a builder and handyman in the town, did whatever he could to get by. They'd been seeing each other since about July of 2019, that's the year, alright. Uh, and you know, they had their good times, but share of bad times too. As do we all, but their bad times... I'll just get into it. But it was that evening, the evening of April 22nd, that Katie Kenyon was reported missing by her family. They couldn't get through to her all day. She hadn't seen her kids, she hadn't picked up her kids. Her family had good reason to be worried. Katie's family, right now from Jump Street, they had a bad feeling about old Andrew over here. They, they did not like him one little iota. They had good reason to also dislike him. He was a bit of a character, and by bit, I mean shit. So, some of Katie's close family, they went to Andrew's address. They began banging on the door, demanding to know where Katie was. They were threatening to kick it in. Andrew was the one who, himself, he called the police. These guys outside are concerned about Katie. Do you know where she is? Yeah, yeah, come on, door. What's up, dude? Uh, I got a text. I must too. Today? Yeah, saying I came to your house this morning. I came to my show your service. From Katie? Yeah. Oh, well, she's obviously driven a car now, didn't she? Yeah. What's she up from there? Police arrived and saw her car was still parked outside his home. He told the police he hadn't a clue where she had been, where she had been all day or where she'd gone, though he had some guesses. Where was she now? She probably ran off to therapy or who knows what. But then he says, look at this, you won't believe this shit. She's been texting me saying she's off. She's Audi 5000. And Andrew had been texting her back, leaving voice messages, asking her to get in touch, that he was worried, but she never responded. Yeah, but I'm at work. Listen, I've just got your message. Will you please ring me? I'm a bit worried. 
Just ring me. You don't have to do this. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about the money. Just ring me, please. Okay. The police searched his home. He helped out, even got them ladders and was joking around. He even let them search the attic. I don't suppose you've got a, a ladder handy, have you? Not at all. <laughs> Do you have an update? Do you have a van? I've got a wheel ladder on it. Do you want to ship me a van? Um, it's just to have a look in that loft, that's all. They checked out her car, and the police told Katie's family and Katie's sister's boyfriend, the one threatening to kick the door in, to get out of here. It was a police matter now. And the police, fair play to him, were taking this extremely seriously from the very beginning. See, it was odd. That day, again, the last day Katie Kenyon was last seen, a number of texts had been sent from Katie's phone to family to friends. Stuff like something's come up. Can't meet you. One to her son reading simply, hey dude, I love you. Sorry. To her daughter, I love you. I'm sorry. Your dad will be looking after you for a while. I need to get help so I can be a better person for you and your brother. Please know I love you and I'm not upset with you. By the way, the spelling mistakes are verbatim. And of course, one to Andrew saying, you know, I, I want you to know I'm truly sorry for everything. Hence why Andrew he was leaving her voicemails and stuff like that, saying, ah, oh, I don't know, I got this message from me. It's kind of like, weird. So not good texts. And then she disappears. You're immediately thinking the worst. But the family, the family of Katie, were certain. Those texts were sent from her phone, but they weren't sent by Katie. In fact, on the Saturday morning, the day after she was reported missing, Katie's sister Facebook messaged Andrew saying, Andy, I think you know a hell of a lot more than you were letting on. I have read over these messages Katie sent to her kids, and she doesn't even spell like that, or speak like that, which is what the kids have also said. Katie knows how to spell and mentioned you have dyslexia, which makes sense to the spelling. You sent them texts. You know where Katie is. The police will trace where she was from the last message sent. Doesn't add up how she would drop her car, her keys, her bank card at yours, but no phone and none of her other bank cards. He said, of course, watch it, myth. Don't throw those accusations around willy-nilly. I, too, am trying to find my on-again, off-again girlfriend, Katie. I'm worried. Me. Of particular interest was that while, spelled W-I-L-E, which Katie never misspelled it that way, but Andrew misspelled it that way all the time. The police began to search for Katie, and in fact, what led them to the forest north of Burnley was her phone signal. She had been in a vehicle traveling north the day she disappeared. Her phone had been in them woods for about an hour, then traveled back to town. Her phone traveled back to town, that is. See, the police were able to follow Katie's movements that morning. She had gone to Andrew's house. Then at 9.30 a.m., the pair stopped off at a McDonald's in Andrew's van. Then they drove north. Later that day, his van was seen driving south back to Burnley, but he was alone in his van. Ding, ding, ding. Alarm bells were going off in the police's heads right immediately. This ain't this ain't so much a who done it, it's a you done it. He done it. After seeing this, the police went back to Andrew's home the Saturday. And they noticed when they walked into his home, his fireplace was lit. This was late a late April, particularly warm uh, in, in the north of England at that time. Place was roasting, like he was burning stuff in his fireplace. Andrew was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping at 9.15 p.m. Um, you've been arrested on suspicion of a kidnap in the case of Kenyon. Yeah. I understand that's why you're in court today. Um, this interview is an urgent interview to try and ascertain the whereabouts of Katie currently. All right, I'm aware that you've requested legal representation, um, but at the moment we have been authorised by the superintendent to conduct this urgent interview because there is a real concern for the safety of Katie and you will get a chance to speak to a solicitor later on. Yeah. I need to caution you that you do not have to say anything, but anything you do say may be given in evidence because you don't have to answer these questions. Yeah, uh, anything you say can be used in court if we get to that point. All right. It's a very simple question, Andrew. Can you tell me where Katie is? I can't. You don't know? So is there any clue you can give us as to where she might be? I did give you a clue earlier on. Um, I think she's a... A rehab centre. A rehab centre. Or some sort of clinic. Right, okay. And where would that be? I haven't got a clue. Right, okay. And why do you think that she's at that location? Yes, that's not that location, one of them locations, yeah. I think, because that's what she talked about. That's what she wanted to do. Right, okay. So that's, she's given an indication that that's yeah. what, what she wanted to do. Uh, but you're telling me you don't know where she is? No. 
I'm going to appeal to you now to, to let me know if you, if you do know anything at all. That's fine. I can't get it myself. Yeah? Hmm. Okay, because I'm sure you're aware that your family are really, really concerned. Yeah. So please, if you do not. I don't, honestly. All right, then. Okay, we needed to give you that opportunity. If you didn't know, yeah. just tell us. Oh, I get it, but I've been arrested for kidnapping. Yeah. I don't want to be dead if you know, dying or something. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, we did. Actually, that's not the case. She obviously could be in any state that we want to know everything we can to be okay, so. No? No. All oh, right, okay. I don't have any more questions on Judge Yeah. No, I don't. All right, then. Is there anything else you want to say before we no. go? It would turn out that Andrew had a real history of being a real piece of shit and uh, his relationship with Katie was just built on manipulation and gaslighting. He was from the area and had a few run-ins with the law before, albeit minor ones. Convicted of perverting the course of justice in 2001, that same year he had been arrested after stealing his boss's car, then selling it for £2,700 and the buyer's Mazda. But since then it seems he kept his nose to the ground and worked odd jobs around the town. When he was taken into custody after Katie's disappearance, the police went through his phone and guess what they found? A month before Katie's disappearance, they got into his iCloud account on his iPhone and he, he had created some notes in his iCloud. The notes he created a month, again a month before she disappeared, it was full of texts that were made to look like Katie had written them about how she had ran off. He was planning for her to disappear and was already writing texts to explain it all away. Texts that read like she was running away to get counselling and therapy for her mental health issues. See, Katie had been seeing a therapist for a while now, helping her deal with her anxiety disorder. Andrew was someone she thought initially would help. He wouldn't. Over the previous months, he'd been anything but helpful, extremely manipulative, vindictive, a gaslighting fella. He would text her things like, You know what, I just think you're feckin' great while at the same time getting out a court order claiming she owed him four and a half thousand pounds, calling up debt collectors to get the money off him, the person he supposedly loves. Collectors had begun calling Katie asking for this money he claimed she owed him. He managed to get her to stop seeing her therapist because the relationship was just so good. She had no anxiety about it, but then as soon as she did, anytime she'd voice any of her anxieties or fears, he was not having it. I would just get her to shut up. And anytime she got a fraction of a hair away from him, he would pull this kind of shit, playing on what he knew were her mental health anxieties, even when he himself had started seeing other women. He would say shit like, oh, you know, we'll get through this together and we can start fresh, while at the same time effectively suing her for money and threatening to take away her car and her house, making her own issues 10 times worse. He would say, oh, don't worry about the debt, I'll sort it out while texting the debt collector that he wouldn't accept anything less than £200 a month from her and that she had a house and a car. Good assets. And any time she blocked him and she said this was all over, he would just go to her car. You know, while she was at work one day, leave chocolates and flowers on the windshield. And then they'd be back to square one. Katie's own mother, the day she disappeared, received a text saying, This is the bravest thing I've ever had to do. I need to find some peace and sort my mind out. So with the six grand Andy gave me to pay the debt off, I'm being free for a while until I figure all this shit out. Andy was suing her for a debt while claiming he loved her and then allegedly giving her money to pay off the debt. He was suing her for. He was claiming anyway that she had gone off to a mental health facility um, when he was the one denying her and he helped with that. I think this could be the ring one of you can I not believe that is, we can sort it out. I hope you need whatever you need from me, I don't have or anybody else. I just need to know you're safe and where you're going, that's all. Yeah. I don't want to go and get the dog today, no? It's with me, mate, I don't, I don't, just let me know what's happening, I, I ain't got a clue. Yeah. Finally, Andrew told Katie that April 22nd would be a fresh start for them. It would be Earth Day. There certainly would be Earth involved that day. Andrew continued to say he hadn't done anything, all the while the police were searching the forest. One of Katie's final texts was to her mom. I'm paranoid to death, he's gonna do some hurt. Couldn't sleep all night. The day before Katie disappeared, Andrew had visited his parents' house to borrow a spade and a stepladder, then drove to Gisborne Forest. There was no signal there, so when he went in his phone disconnected, but it reconnected about an hour and a half later. 
when he was asked about what were you doing in the forest, you know, the day before your girlfriend disappeared, he said uh, he'd gone up there because he was preparing a little picnic for him and Katie. Oh. And finally, witnesses would come forward and say the day after Katie disappeared, the Saturday, Andrew had gone to work in a house just like normal, not a bother on him, he was in grand form. Um, and, and you know, the, the homeowner of the house Andrew was working at would say, yeah, it's grand, fine. He did ask this one question though. He asked the homeowner, what time do your bins get taken out at? You know? And the homeowner told him. Then a couple of hours later, the homeowner went out to those very same bins and opened it up and seen bags inside. Bags that were filled with leaves, foliage, Katie Kenyon's flip-flops, and blood. Confronted with all of this and with really no way out for Andrew, five days after Katie vanished and she still hadn't been found in the woods, he told the police this. I believe that you want to speak to us today, um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you to tell us what you want to say. We parked the van up and we, we went to our, our site, which we always go to. Uh, I say always, we've been twice, twice. Right. Uh, that's, that's, that's where she still is. That's where she still is. Okay. Yes, they had gone out to the woods that day. They were having a great time. And at one point, Andrew decided to start building a fire. He got the axe out and started chopping wood. That's when Katie said she had a, had a can of coke in her hand. She's like, bet you can't hit this with the axe, like tomahawk style. Andrew said, watch this. And then it was a complete freak accident. Of course, he hit her in the head with the axe, not the can. He said he threw the axe at the tree, bounced off the tree, clocked her. So we don't know what, what went wrong. You were aiming at the tree and no, I can't even say I slip, no, like nothing. I just don't even know what we're wrong. It's just stupid, isn't it? But I'll never do that. It's so, so stupid. How close was she from you? Yeah, eight feet, ten feet. There's no help there, you know, No. No people. No signal on the phone, they won't carry her. So the boy think I'll carry you on girlfriend. Talk me talk me through these next seconds that this has happened now. I just don't know what I'm doing on this I don't I'm I'm clothing clothing school to her straight on here. Mm. She was killed instantly, he said. It was a freak accident. How was I supposed to know that throwing an axe in her general direction would kill her? He panicked, and then he dug a shallow grave for Katie so animals wouldn't get at her. He had planned on following her over to the other side, but he, well, I guess he decided against it. It was a few days later that Andrew agreed to take him to the scene. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is you do not have to say anything, but anything you do say will be given evidence, okay? So all I have to say is that you are under caution, not to follow the procedure, so that anything that you see that is said, can be noted down, okay. Just here? Okay. Just stand up for me, Andrew. Stand up. Just come over here. Watch your head. Katie Kenyon was finally found. And at this stage, they say they're not in a position to formally confirm the woman's bod identity, but they do believe that the body is that of Katie. Her family have been told and they continue to be supported by specially trained officers. So a body has been found in the search for missing Katie Kenyon. Andrew Burfield, uh, who's 50 and of Burnley, has been charged with her murder. But, I feel like I'm saying that a lot in this video, booty. Um, the medical examiner, when Katie Kenyon's body was finally found, would reveal that, well, um, it must have been quite the freak accident, and Andrew must have been really determined to hit that coke can, because it would be revealed that Katie Kenyon had been struck at least 12 times with the axe to the head, and had no visible defensive wounds on her. She had been ambushed and slaughtered, then buried in the middle of nowhere. I just don't even know what we're wrong. It's just stupid, isn't it? But I'll never do that. It's so stupid. 
thing is, Andrew, you've told us a lot over oh. the last few days, haven't you? And you've told us a lot, certainly today, a lot of information. And a lot of it just does not add up, okay? And ultimately, we don't believe you of what you've said. Okay, I do not believe that this has been an accident. This is about your control and your over over Katie, and you're losing the control. It's you have not dug that hole in the ten minutes that you have said to us. It might have been longer. Okay. I've got how long we're there, do I? I'm saying dug all that. We know how long you're there, and you're not long enough. Katie herself even had her concerns about you. She even told her own sister. Basically, what she said to her sister was, if I go missing, it will be him, meaning you, who's done it. Andrew Burfield maintained his innocence. The prosecution didn't accept this at all. They said it was a planned and premeditated murder. The texts to the burial of the grave the day before proved it, and it proved he was a monster. It wasn't until day three of his trial that Andrew changed his plea and pleaded guilty to the murder of Katie Kenyon. Andrew Burfield was given a life sentence with the minimum of 32 years in prison. With his age, he will likely die in there. Andrew Burfield is a callous, cold, manipulative individual. He's a vile individual. He meticulously planned the murder of Katie to a manner I have never seen before and hope never to see again. He then went on to brutally and savagely attack Katie. But his offending went far beyond that. His offending throughout the course of their relationship was one of manipulation and mental torture for Katie. In contrast, Katie is a loving, caring mother of two who never deserved this to happen. The family and myself would like to appeal to anybody who's out there to say if you are in a relationship and you have concerns about your partner or if you have concerns about anybody else and think they may have concerns relating to their partner i would request and the family would request that you contact the police and make a clear or application be very keen to ensure that nobody else is harmed in the way that katie can harm in this occasion and so ends the story of katie kenyon and andrew uh, Burfield. You know, it, it's a story of a real son of a bitch monster. Somebody who, you know, it's about control. It's not even about control. It's about total domination of another person. Katie, you know, when she initially met him, she was like, oh, you know, she had her own struggles financially, mental health. And so she found this older man who she's like, oh man, he's going to be like my rock, you know, he'll take care, he'll take care of me, he'll take care of everything. And that's what she thought initially. Then she got to know him a little bit better, and then the be the be the abuse began with his gaslighting and his manipulation of everything, pushing and pulling constantly. She didn't know what was going on. She got used to it, or should I say, became emotionally damaged by it. And then finally, he killed her. The judge just said he didn't even know why, uh, what the motive was of the murder. But I think the motive just really was he wanted complete control over her to the point where. Well, complete control over her life, and then complete control over her death. He was a terrible liar, though. And if control was what he wanted, that is the one thing he does not have now. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Watching this whole video with me it means a lot, as you know. Um, right, here, listen, uh, please check me out on Instagram, on Twitter, and check out the That Chapter podcast, which has a new episode out every Monday. But you know what? Until the next whole video, which will be up in a couple of days, every Tuesday at 8, every Friday at 8, my time. 3 p.m. EST. I'll see you then. Right. Um, you know, until then, just like take care of yourself. Because I love you. My gift.